the cat, a year ago the cat. Um, and let's look at the classwork. <laughs> classwork, classwork. All right. So there is a new Cornell Notes assignment for because we're in a new unit. And I wanted to keep going with Cornell Notes. I kind of like it. Um, there's a slideshow here because, um, it, so the, um, the, the handwritten notes, um, they work for some things. They work for like, um, if there's like a, a process and if we ever, if I ever like have to teach more math, then, um, I'll probably make more handwritten notes, but, um, for now, uh, like it's it's a lot of like visual representations of things, and for that um, PowerPoint works really well, especially when you do as I have done and steal the PowerPoint from a very clever PowerPoint mechanic. Um, and yeah, so uh, these slides have been compiled from um, the unit the for. Um, energy and physical chemistry from uh, the same website that I stole the previous slides from. So if you're if you're looking for those on the internet and want to see a more complete um, collection, it's out there. Um, meanwhile, we have an assignment today. I'm, I have I hear someone's mic on, and I'm just going to mute you. There you go. Sorry. Um, and, um, all right, so here's what we're doing today. We're going to go over changes of state. There's this kind of guided practice note thing, um, slash worksheet. It's part of the assignment. Um, we'll talk about intermolecular forces and what those are and what those mean and how they affect this change of state. Uh, we'll talk about vapor pressure graphs. A little bit, maybe. Oh, that, that'll be in the Ed Puzzle, actually. That'll be in the Ed Puzzle. And it's towards the, we won't get to this, but it's in the Ed Puzzle. Um, heating curves, we will talk about. And phase diagrams, we will also talk about. Um, and meanwhile, there is a link to Ed Puzzle because, as I have mentioned, there will be an Ed Puzzle. Um, and that's here. And um, that's the portion of the class that I'm not going to record because, as I mentioned, there's student information in Edpuzzle. Um, and I want to keep that out of my videos. And I'm going to move myself over to here. Now, oh, what am I doing? I'm just going to present. think. And I'm on the correct slide. Hooray. All right. Um, so this, this slide is unintentionally left blank. It was blank. Uh, it, it, it went blank after I copied and pasted from the slideshow that I stole these from. Um, and uh, let's see. Keyboard work. Why, why you not work? All right. So in, in any given compound, there are kind of three different possible types of bonds in a compound. And these are, these are um, molecular bonds, right? So molecules can have these different types of bonds within the molecule, all right? They can have covalent bonds where um, each atom completely shares the electrons. There can be polar covalent bonds where one atom grabs more or has spends more time with the electrons than the other atom. And there can be ionic bonds where um, one of the atoms has completely taken an extra electron, has become charged, and the two things um, stick together based on uh, dipole forces. 
So um, it, if, you, if you look at the notes for this, this slide, just keep in mind, I didn't write these notes. There's kind of a, a, a political statement explanation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it misrepresents the definition of socialism. Um, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe covalent bonds are a little bit like, a little bit like communism. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't want to get too political about it. Um, at least not for YouTube. Um, that may come at a different time. All right. So, uh, these, these chemical bonds, when we have two identical non-metal atoms, those are non-polar covalent bonds. They're able to share their electrons equally. They have to be the same element, they have to be the same element. If we have two different, two different non-metal atoms, one of those atoms will hold on to the electrons more closely than the other. The electrons are shared unequally. And between a non-metal and a reactive metal, those will be ionic, and the electrons get transferred completely. These increase in ionic character and increase in, um, they, they tend to be more soluble, although we've seen cases in which the ionic bonds um, aren't able to be broken by, uh, by the, the, the water, salvation energy. And this is the same slide over again. So um, the molecular bonds are a little bit different than what we're going to be talking about today. So what we'll talk about today are intermolecular bonds. I'm going to switch to the other side because I'm blocking the view. Um, intermolecular bonds take place between different molecules. Uh, or they can be, you know, the same kind of molecule, or the same substance, or the same compound, but they're different, two different molecules, and they interact, and they have an intermolecular force, or an intermolecular interaction. Um, and those intermolecular forces are what determine the temperature at which a particular compound will exist in each of these three phases of matter. Now, there are, there are six, I want to mention this, there are six different phases of matter. There are these three, solid, liquid, and gas, and there are also three more kind of exotic phases of matter. Um, the first is plasma, um, which is, I think it's a low pressure gas with an, a stream of charged particles running through it and it creates light and it's this whole kind of phenomena. The, the most compelling example I know of uh, that's plasma is the aurora borealis or the aurora australis. Um, and what else? So there's plasma, there's uh, something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, and then there's something called a fermionic condensate. And the fermionic condensate is like, uh, they, they just, it was just recently described, um, like last fall, uh, the fermionic condensate was, was published. Um, but anyway, I don't want to talk about those three things too much right now. I don't want to harsh on anyone's vibe. Like if you, if you, in the future, you're like, I'm going to be a fermionic condensate scientist, like by all means, do your thing. Um, but I don't want to talk about it right now. We're going to focus on solids, liquids, and gases. So. Uh, let's see, Woo. Hey, come on, there we go, chat window says, where's my chat, lightning has plasma in the center, yeah, yeah, so, so, um, like, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, lightning sparks are actually plasma, um, and there's, a, there's a, there's like a plasma generator thing that's like, a toy that they used to sell. They probably still sell it. Uh, um, but yeah, it like shoots like, like strands of light um, from an electrode onto a glass surface. Um, anyway, 
Um, so solids, arc lighters, yes. Um, solids exist. I, 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 don't wanna, I, I don't. We don't have. We don't have time to talk about plasma right now. Um, come back. Come back. Wait. Here we go. Okay. Solids. Solids happen when a compound doesn't have enough molecular motion to overcome the intermolecular forces holding those molecules together. All right. Now. The molecules still have some motion. They still move around a little bit, but they just kind of shimmy in place. They vibrate. They vibrate. Um, and these intermolecular forces will hold them in place. And for some compounds, like water, for instance, here we see water, those molecules will be held together in a regular, orderly fashion. And this orderly fashion is something called a crystal structure. It's a crystal structure. So any crystal is just a, it's a large version of this tiny, tiny pattern of molecules fitting together in a characteristic way. Now, there are, there's a different category of solids that exist that um, don't have a crystal structure. Those are called amorphic solids. Um, and in an amorphic solid, the molecules or the atoms are just kind of arranged in any old haphazard manner. Um, glass is a great example of an amorphic solid. And now, when I was young, um, like shortly after fire was discovered, glass, uh, they, they said that glass was a super cooled liquid. And they, they cited as evidence, they're like, because we see in, um, in old window panes, the glass will flow over time and become thicker at the bottom of the pane than it is at the top. And uh, what was actually happening is they were, this was spurious evidence of, of a thing that was explainable by another, another phenomenon. And that's what, uh, so, so here's what happened. Before something called float glass was developed, where a glass pain is, is uh, cast by floating molten glass on top of molten aluminum, and this creates a very flat pane of glass that has very uniform thickness. Before we developed that process, we had uh, glass makers making window panes by blowing out a bubble of glass, opening it on one end, and then spinning it to make it flatten out and get thin. Now, what happens when you stretch something you know, when you stretch glass in that way, then it ends up thinner at one edge than it is at the other. And so when they cut panes from that glass, those panes of glass were thicker on one edge than they were at the other. Now, as it happens, there's only one way to install an unevenly thick window pane in a window frame and have it not break in a short amount of time. And that way is you may have guessed it, it's with the thick part at the bottom of the window. So over time, all the panes of glass that had the thick edge on any other side other than the bottom broke and were replaced until that thick edge ended up at the bottom. And so like kind of post ex facto, we are looking at this stuff and we're like, aha, these window panes are all thicker at the bottom than they were at the top. Ergo, uh, spurious evidence. All right, amorphous solid, not a super cooled liquid, glass. Most other solids have a crystal structure. They fit together in this pattern like this. The molecules shimmy in place, they vibrate, but they don't zoom around. Okay. Here we have uh, two different molecular models of ice. On the left, we have a ball and stick model. And uh, we see the intermolecular force, the hydrogen bond between the hydrogen atom and the, the um, oxygen of the neighboring water molecule indicated via a dotted line. So we have hydrogen bonds shown here, and this is a ball and stick model of each atom. On the right, we have a space filling model. So in this space filling model, each of the atoms is represented by um, uh, a ball. 
Yeah. I'd like to point out that these are roughly either they're, they're like the same size. They're the same size, same number of molecules, same bonds. It's just that one is shown um, with the bonds indicated, and the other is shown as a space filling model. Liquids. How do you get a liquid? How do you get a liquid? You, you like if if ice heats up, it turns into water, right? Liquid water. And so what happens with a liquid is that the molecules are moving around faster. Molecules are in constant motion. Now there's still an appreciable intermolecular force between the molecules in that liquid. And um, that holds those molecules really close together, which means that liquids are almost incompressible. They're not totally incompressible, but they're pretty close to being incompressible. They're so incompressible that we can use that property of liquids to make machines that uh, use like shifting liquids from one um, container to the next. Um, we call these these hydraulic machines. So like a hydraulic press. If you ever if you ever want to fall into a, a YouTube hole, uh, look up the hydraulic press channel. Totally worth it. D don't do it right now. Don't stop. I know. I know. I hear you doing it. I hear you. You know who I'm talking to. Okay. Uh, and liquids don't fill the container. I mean, unless we like, you know, put extra effort into filling the container, unless we have a, a, the same volume container as the liquid. Like there's coffee in my mug, but it's not like, doesn't, it didn't expand once I put it in the container. Um, now these intermolecular forces are, uh, create something called surface tension. And, um, and that tendency for the liquid to hold together as well. Um, surface tension and also buoyancy. So uh, the, the tendency for this, this water strider beetle to stay on top of the liquid um, is a result of those intermolecular forces. You know, interestingly enough, intermolecular forces are also what keep my coffee cup from just plummeting through my desk when I set it down. Um, it's just that the intermolecular forces are so strong that the thing is a solid instead of a liquid. In a gas, those molecules have acquired so much energy that they're zooming around. They've overwhelmed the intermolecular forces that were holding them together. There's a lot of space between those molecules and they fill the container that they're in. We have to put a cork in it in order to keep the gas from escaping. That's how fast it's zooming. All right. So um, as we transition between those phases, uh, there's some language that we want to address. And for some of them, it, it's, it's common. We'll get to it. But for now, we want to talk about two key properties. One is evaporation and the other is condensation. And that's moving from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid. So evaporation is the vaporing, like it's turning something, we see this word vapor here, it's turning something into a vapor, right? And then condensing is like pushing that together and it, it sticks, to, it, it becomes denser. It's with densening, it makes it, yeah. All right, um, so the Evaporation is liquid to gas, and condensation is gas to liquid. Um, if we add energy, what, what kind of energy? Does anybody, what kind of energy are, are we adding? Anyone? Anyone? Oh my goodness, there's an emoji. In the, oh. um, I'll just, hang on, I need to shut my window. Thermal, yes! thermal energy, heat, we're adding heat. And as we add heat, uh, those intermolecular bonds, not the molecular bonds, not the covalent, uh, polar covalent or ionic bonds, but the molecular bonds that hold the molecules together. So things like hydrogen bonds and electrostatic bonds and dipole-dipole uh, bonds, um, 
What's another one? Van der Waals force? Anyway, these are all intermolecular forces. And um, so those intermolecular forces get overwhelmed as we add thermal energy, because what thermal energy ends up doing is it makes a molecule vibrate, and then it makes a molecule zoom around, to use a technical term. It, it gives the molecules zoomies. It's kind of like um, what happens late at night with my cat, and she just like zoom, zooms. I haven't, hopefully she doesn't turn into a gas at some point, um, but if she does, she may condense. Um, she does spend a lot of time sleeping, releasing energy and forming intermolecular bonds. Um, so as energy is acquired by the system, the molecules move faster, those intermolecular bonds become overwhelmed to hold the substance together, and uh, the molecules are set free as a vapor. If the molecules slow down, then they're able to interact with one another. The amount of energy they have in their motion isn't sufficient to overcome the intermolecular forces. They stick together, they coalesce, they condense, and they form from vapor, a liquid. They form a liquid from vapor. All right, here's a little bit of flow chart with the three states of matter that we're talking about. I don't want to hear anything about plasma. I want to hear it. I, I just, I'm watching you chat. All right. Um, I do want to hear about, please, like, feel free to, I don't want to discourage anyone from talking. I love talking about plasma. Um, but solids. So solids, if we um, here, this is the common language I was talking about. Freezing and melting. We all know about freezing and melting. If we freeze a liquid, it turns into a solid. If we melt a solid, it turns into a liquid. We melt solids by adding heat. We freeze liquids by removing heat. Um, the ones we just talked about are condensing gases. Again, we remove heat to condense a gas. And evaporating a liquid, and we add heat to the liquid in order to evaporate it. The one we haven't talked about just yet is this, this transition here, from a solid to a gas. Solid to a gas. And a gas can form directly from a solid through a process known as sublimation or subliming. Subliming. And a gas can form directly into a solid by the reverse process, which is not what it says here. This is an image. I need to make a note on the slide that says that this is wrong. The process is not subliming when it changes from a gas to a solid. It's known as deposition. Deposition. There will be another slide with that word on it, so look ahead. All right. Here we have a wonderful graphical uh, interpretation of the zoomies I was talking about. <clears throat> so we know from numerous external sources, I'm speaking of cartoons and comic strips, web comics, um, venerable traditions of, of artistry and iconography, that lines such as these will indicate movement. The longer the line, the faster the movement. Okay, so here we see lines that are particular, when compared with these lines over here in the liquid, particularly long, indicating a very fast movement. Um, these angled lines indicate that this particle is careening off of the wall of this container. The distribution of these particles in, uh, suggests that the container is completely filled uh, at any time with whatever number of particles might be occupying it. The distance between them indicates that we might compress these particles into a smaller space. Um, and yeah, so long tails, much zoomies, very fast. The gas. Um, not sticking together because it has overwhelmed the intermolecular forces that I've mentioned. As we move on to the liquid, the tails are much shorter, indicating a slower speed but still, you know, this will be enough speed to kind of disrupt the shape of the thing 
and these particles will move past one another, but they still stick together because they haven't completely overwhelmed the intermolecular forces of the compound. Finally, on the right, they've lost their tails entirely, at least visibly so. They're not moving around much at all. They're just, we can't really see it here, but they are vibrating in place. They're vibrating in place. But that vibration isn't enough to overwhelm the combined intermolecular forces that hold each particle in place relative to its neighbors. Um, incidentally, does anyone happen to know what, uh, what happens, like, what the point is at which all molecular motion stops? What's that point? If you know it, type it in the chat or shout it out. Um, but in the solid, um, there will be some heat, so these molecules will still be moving. They're just vibrating in place, vibrating in place. I want to point out that the intermolecular forces between all of these compounds, that, that it's going to be a property of the compound. That intermolecular force is going to be the same. Uh, zero K, yes, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. That's the point at which all molecular motion stops. Um, so the intermolecular forces are going to be the same. They'll tend to be the same. It's just that the, the energy of each particle will increase. So the particles can overwhelm the force that might hold them together. All right, here's another graphical uh, indication of some of these properties of the states of matter. A solid will hold its shape. It'll have a fixed volume. A liquid will also have a fixed volume but the liquid will kind of flow based on the shape of the container or whether you shake it or not, I guess. Um, you can change its shape and you can, modify, you can disrupt the surface of it and deform it. It'll still hold together though. Um, the gas will take also the shape of the container, but the gas will fill the entire volume of the container. As we add heat to a solid, it becomes a liquid. And as we add heat to a liquid, it becomes a gas. Another chart, another, um, incidentally, if you open the, the PowerPoint, each one of these dots is its own separate image object. It's amazing. Um, so a solid has a definite shape. A liquid will take the shape of the container, as will the gas. Solids and liquids both have a definite volume, while the gas will fill the volume of the container. Solids have a fixed arrangement of particles. The intermolecular forces are holding everything together. They have, they're very close together. Liquids are still very close together, but the particles have enough energy to kind of overwhelm the more distant of the intermolecular forces. So they're able to slip past and move around. Um, and in a gas, everything is random and everything is spread apart. The fact that everything is spread apart is what allows us to compress gases um, in, into smaller containers. Um, the interactions between the particles are going to be a function of those intermolecular forces and also the temperature and pressure of a system. So, in a solid, those interactions are going to be very strong, very strong interactions. Um, there's not enough energy for the, the molecule, each molecule to overcome those interactions, so they stay stuck together. Interactions still quite strong among the particles of a liquid, um, but in a gas, everything's moving around so quickly that if two particles happen to collide, they end up just kind of bouncing off one another, and there's not much interaction at all. Okay, now we're going to talk about what goes on with evaporation. Now, in order to evaporate, molecules have to have enough energy to break those intermolecular forces. This will happen in pretty much any liquid, at the surface of the, li the liquid. Um, now, how shall I put this? This is because, remember what we mentioned about zero Kelvin? So unless something is at zero Kelvin, it has some kind of heat in it, and those 
molecules will be moving around. In fact, if something is a liquid, it has to have kind of a lot of heat because those particles are moving pretty quickly relative to its solid state, that is. So these molecules at the surface will break away and become a gas, but only those ones with the enough kinetic energy will escape. Breaking those intermolecular forces requires energy, which means that the process of evaporation is endothermic. And this word, it means that heat, therm, flows into, endo, endo means into, therm means heat, heat flows into this system. So we like to talk about two different uh, modes of heat transfer. One is endothermic, uh, an endothermic process, the other is an exothermic process. And both of those words refer to what happens to the system relative to the surroundings. So if heat is flowing into the system, it's endothermic. If heat is flowing out of the system, it's exothermic. So evaporation is endothermic. Heat flows from the system, or sorry, heat flows into the system from the surroundings, which means evaporation is a cooling process because it cools down the surroundings. So if we feel something that's, if like if we touch something that's evaporating, um, it's, it feels cool because like we are the surroundings and that thing is the system. Um, and it requires heat to proceed. That's how sweat works. Quit reading ahead. Condensation is the change from a gas to a liquid. Condensation would be an exothermic process. Exothermic process. So in order for condensation to happen, it has to release heat into the surroundings. The gas will release heat and a liquid will form. Condensation will achieve a dynamic equilibrium with vaporization in a closed system. Okay, so that's kind of a dense statement. So let's unpack it a little. First, what's a closed system? What's a closed system? So that means that matter can't go into or out of our system. So here in our system, system here, we have matter, and we're gonna put a cork in it. That'll be on the next slide. So now what the heck is a dynamic equilibrium? We've talked about vaporization. We know pretty well what a cheese it means. So a closed system will close it, and then what's the dynamic equilibrium? Now we have talked about equilibrium, but um, when first sealed, so we seal this off, and the molecules gradually escape the surface of, of the liquid, and then eventually they'll build up above the liquid and some of them will condense back down to the liquid. And a dynamic equilibrium is reached when the rate at which the molecules evaporate and condense are equal. So the way this happens is um, over time, vaporization will remain constant if we assume that this is at a constant temperature. But the rate of condensation will increase because there are more molecules in the vapor phase to condense. So as time goes on, uh, we reach a point at which the rate of vaporization, so molecules moving into the vapor phase, becomes equivalent to the rate of condensation. So these two things, they equal each other out and that's equilibrium. And since molecules are constantly changing phase, that's what makes it dynamic. There's this other thing that's kind of incidental, I think, to the equal rates. The equal rates. The equal rates mean that these volumes uh, remain constant, or this volume and this vapor pressure remain constant. So, vaporization is an endothermic process. It requires heat to flow into the thing that's vaporizing. Energy is required to overcome intermolecular forces. And since it cools the surroundings, um, vaporization is what's responsible for cooling the Earth down. Otherwise, the Earth would just kind of collect solar energy and uh, emit 
like geothermal energy and become very, very hot. Um, it's also why we sweat. Yes, yes, thank you, chat, for reading four slides ahead. That's why we sweat, is to cool ourselves down, because, like, again, we are the system, or sorry, the sweat is the system, we are the surroundings, the sweat evaporates, and the, system, uh, the surroundings get cooled down. The surroundings push heat into the system in order for the evaporation to happen. So here's a little diagram um, with uh, energy changes accompanying phase changes. So we just have, it's a one axis thing. We have energy of the system from bottom to top. Energy, uh, energy increases from, so gases are more energy than liquids, which are more energy than, uh, if it helps, I didn't read ahead. I just thought sweat was the evaporation. So, Yes, I, 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 I'm just, um, thank, I know, I, I'm, all right. So, as a solid changes to a liquid, it, we call that melting, as we know, um, as a solid melts into a liquid, the energy of the system increases, which means the energy of the surroundings will decrease. So that would be an endothermic, endothermic process. As a liquid freezes into a solid, the energy of the system will decrease and it will lose heat to the surroundings. It's exothermic, exothermic. As a liquid evaporates, the system gains energy. Energy goes into the system to evaporate the liquid, um, making it endothermic as a gas condenses into a liquid, the system loses energy, which makes it exothermic. Energy flows into the surroundings, out of the system into the surroundings. Finally, a solid may sublimate. So the solid the particles speed up or they gain enough energy to break the intermolecular forces. They turn into a gas. Energy or the system absorbs energy. It's endothermic. Heat flows into the system. Whoops, wrong arrow. And finally, the gas may lose enough energy to condense uh, to deposit directly as a solid with deposition. And again, when this happens, uh, the system loses energy. It loses energy. Heating curve for water. All right. Quick question. Um, kind of an easy question, I think. Are heat and temperature the same thing? Are heat and temperature the same thing? Just like, just looking at this slide, what do you think? I mean, we have heat on one axis and temperature on the other. Am I frozen? No, that's weird. My zoom window is frozen. My zoom window is on the previous slide, but um, for my, that's weird. There it goes. Okay. Heat is the thermal energy and temperature is just the measure of it. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Okay, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it, and it's, Okay, so check this. So, so let's look at this. So we have temperature on the y-axis. We have heat on the x-axis. So from what's happening from A to B? So we're adding heat. Temperature's going up. Then we hit 0 C, and it stops the temperature going up. Stops it right there, 0 C. Then from C to D, Temperature increases until we hit 100 C. 
and then it stops, the temperature stops going up, but we add more and more heat. And then at some point, the temperature starts going up again. So what's going on here? What is it? Why is it zero and 100? Why? Why? Why could it be? Why could? What is happening? Why do we add heat? And the temperature does not change and then it freezing and boiling points. Yes. hundred. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the freezing point of water is zero C below zero C we have a solid. So what will happen is we'll add heat to the solid. It'll increase in temperature until it reaches zero C and then it will melt. And we can try as we might, we can't get it as a solid to go past its melting point. All we can do is get it to melt. At some point, the entire solid has melted and now we have a liquid and we can increase the temperature of that liquid until it reaches its boiling point. And then we try as we might, we can't make that liquid increase in temperature anymore until all of the liquid has turned into a vapor. So we have a solid, a liquid, and a gas. And as we move from left to right, we melt or vaporize. And if we move from right to left, we condense or freeze. Okay, that was a heating curve. We have temperature and heat. Next, we have a phase diagram where we have temperature on the x-axis instead of the y-axis. And we have pressure on the y-axis. And we didn't even have pressure before. Didn't have pressure. Okay, so let's look at this. How does this how can we read this? So as we go up on this chart, we increase pressure. As we go to the right, we increase temperature. So this line, okay, from the triple point to the critical point, along this line, we have the boiling line. The boiling line. This is the, um, this is the temperature and pressure at which uh, the, this liquid will turn into a vapor at all, you know, throughout its entire volume, not just at the surface. Okay. This line here, this is the solidification line or the freezing, melt, melting freezing line, right? So it's still pressure sensitive, but a little bit like it's a little bit different. So at one atmosphere, where one atmosphere intersects with this freezing line, we have the normal freezing point, and where one atmosphere intersects with the boiling line, we have the boiling point. Okay, we know pretty well what those things are. But uh, what about this thing over here? Over here we have this thing, this is a critical point. And this is a temperature and pressure at which the liquid phase and the vapor phase exist in equilibrium. I'll say that again. This is the point at which the liquid phase and the vapor phase exist in equilibrium. So the transition between vapor and liquid is completely reversible at this point. And um, it forms something called a supercritical fluid. Supercritical fluid. If you want a good demonstration of a supercritical fluid, you should check out Mr. Nile Red and his wonderful uh, aerogel video. Uh, he goes through a lot of time, effort, and money making something called aerogel, uh, which is the lightest, like, material known. Um, anyway, or the least dense, rather. Um, 
Okay, so that's the critical point. Love air gel, yes. Okay, and then uh, down here is the triple point. The triple point is the temperature and pressure at which all three phases exist in equilibrium. All three phases exist in equilibrium. Now, down in this region here, we have uh, the sublimation and de uh, deposition line. Out here, we have the boiling and condensation or the evaporation and condensation line. And up here, we have the freezing and melting line. Okay, so in this region here, things are a solid. In this middle region, they are a liquid. And out here, they're a gas. Out in this region over here, this is the no man's land of the supercritical fluid. Again, melting and freezing across this line up here, vaporization and condensation along this line over here. And down here, we have sublimation and deposition. And right there is the triple point. That's the triple point. Same thing over again. Same thing. And triple point. Supercritical fluid. Sublimation deposition. All right. That's all I have for the video for today. I'm going to switch over to... Um, it's time for our Ed Puzzle. Ed Puzzle, yay! So I'm stopping recording.